Bola Emiko, thank you for your time with us today. Thank you. Let me start by asking you, did you always ever want to be a king? Well, the honest answer is yes. And that's because I think every young, every young child who is the son of a king will look at his father and wish or oh, one day Every, every son wants to be like his father. And obviously, if your father being a king, naturally, the thought is going to cross your mind and you're going to have that dream, that fantasy, that desire. So, yes, he did. And you did say that your father ascended the throne at the age of 44. About 44, and yes. And now you're doing, uh, you're almost walking in his steps. You ascended the throne also as a young uh, person. How does that make you feel? Well, um... I'm not entirely sure how it makes me feel because you can't plan that, oh, by the time I'm this certain age, I would like to be king because that inevitably means you are wishing or pushing somebody out who would, well, in this case, my predecessor is my uncle, but wishing or anticipating that you are trying to push out your father, you know, which you don't want to do or imagine. Um, so it's bittersweet. It's happened, but you know, you've also lost someone there to you for it to happen. And I think it also goes hand in hand with um, the way I see, the way I see God. Time is literally in his hands. He is sovereign. So when things happen, whether or not you feel you are ready for it or you're happy about it, you just have to relax into the knowledge that time and everything is planned in his hands and trust that it is the right time, it's the right moment. And obviously you grew up in a royal family and uh, you were, were most likely probably trained, you know, for this day. Can you tell us more about how that was like for you growing up as a prince, knowing that to, today, this day was probably inevitable? Well, to once again to be candid there wasn't any formal training at least in my upbringing my father ran a my parents ran a very modern household i've always told people especially when i was in boarding school when they would ask me oh what is it like to grow up in the palace and i said look if you could just teleport and show up in our house you would believe you are in a normal house um, you'd see my dad reclined watching TV with his children, watching his sons playing video games. And we lived a very regular life. But obviously, because there was so much palace activity going on, you naturally observed what was going on. My father almost never taught me and said, this is how you do this. He almost never, he almost never did that. Some chiefs would come around and say, I hope you are paying attention to this. Observe this, observe that. That was their own initiative. It was not their role. Some relatives also would come around and say the same, you know, pay attention to this. You can see how, you know, I hope you are paying attention. And that was basically the extent of the training. But I think to sum it all, some things are caught, not taught. And I think in that regard, I caught a lot of things from my father, as opposed to being formally taught. And you spoke about uh, attending a boarding school. I mean, aside from growing up in the palace, you had to live the life of a young man, you know, the young person interacting with the outside world. Uh, how was that like for you? Were you treated differently or were there challenges and issues that, that came up with that? I think I, I think I understand the question you're trying to ask. Uh, and I'm, imag I'm imagining maybe Prince William or Harry going to Harrow or wherever. It's England and everybody knows, oh my goodness, that is the Queen's grandson. That is the future king. Not quite the same here. Had I gone to boarding school here in Warri, maybe there would have been some sort of semblance of that, as in, oh, that is the Oro of Wari's son. 
And I probably would have gotten in trouble for that anyways. Some people would have probably picked on me for that reason. But the boarding school I went to was, first of all, it was a five plus hour drive from here in Kwara State, Adesoye College. And at the time, this was between 1995 and 2001, Adesoye was quite the elite boarding school in Nigeria. So a lot of prominent people's children were in that school. Captains of industry, at the time, military governor's children. Um, in fact, even when the late head of state died, we woke up the next morning and the new head of state, his son happened to be in our school. You know, So there were other monarchs, whose prominent monarchs, whose children were in our school. So I didn't stand out because my father was, because I was a prince, because there were other princes, there were other nobility, if you would, you know. So there was nothing special about that. Uh, can you remember when you got the call or you got, got a notice that the day had come and um, it was your turn now to ascend the throne to become the Oluo Fori? Can you describe to us how that felt like for you? Mm. It was... It was a cocktail of emotions, and it was also a slow build. It wasn't just boom, one time. Obviously, my uncle passed in December, and I was not formally presented until um, early April. But even before early April, I, it was evident that it was going in this direction. And <clears throat> there was a sense, there was a heavy sense of destiny, Inevit almost like it was inevitable, sort of. But there was also a sense of, this is Nigeria. There could be something that truncates this at, at the last moment. And that's not a personal bias. I think there are many people in Nigeria who you can say they were destined it was such and such was meant for them. It was theirs. And everybody knew it. But they had, too often something happens and it doesn't happen. And I think that has also gone a long way in the Nigerian mindset, people feeling, hmm, let's see how this goes. And I think there was also that feeling, so many people like, oh my goodness, this young man, what happened in 2015, he was kind of up for it, but, hmm. And so it's almost like, okay, it has come back. Is he going to be allowed to get it? So I knew that loomed over me. And I guess I was also trying to guard my own heart. Um, so that's what I mean about it being a slow build. But when it became apparent, which actually was on my birthday, oddly enough, it was on my birthday, the 2nd of April, that formally the chiefs confirmed in the presence of the oracle and everybody who witnessed that it is done. And I guess at that point in time, I was, I don't know, I, I can't recall what I felt because I had anticipated maybe like analysis paralysis. And then when the moment came, it was like, okay, it's done. Your Majesty, let's talk a bit about the controversy surrounding your ascension to the throne. There were talks that you were not qualified for that seat. How do you respond to that? Well, I think um, one has to look at the way things flow naturally. Once again, if we go back to 2015 and there were valid or legitimate reasons to have us set aside you know, we took that in good faith and we moved on with life. And nothing changes. And the same instrument that was used to set us aside is the same instrument that has brought us back. And with such overwhelming support, 
yes, there are voices who, as I alluded to earlier, interpret it a different way. And that's, that's fine, you know. Um, the Bible says, woe if all men speak well of you. So I guess I'm in good company knowing that, okay, not everybody is speaking well of me. That's fine. You know, and it's not, it's not just for today or just for this process. Even going forward into the rain, you don't expect that all the time everyone is going to be happy with, with your decisions or the circumstances around your rain. People will always have in their mind legitimate reason to feel this is not right. And you still have to take that in good faith, you know. So um, it's, it's the human way. I am, I am at peace with the process because I didn't lobby. I did not manipulate. I didn't, um, I didn't fight for it. In fact, I, so I supported what happened in 2015. Could have cried, could have gone to court, but in all ways possible, material, emotional, prayers, supported the process. And I guess that's how nature has a way, God has a way of doing its own thing. And that's simply what I believe this is. You know, it comes with its own bag of emotions, but that's plainly what this is. Yeah, and you know, those issues that refuse to die away, like we woke up this morning to the police saying that they they wanted to question two princes with regards to the, thro the, the crown of the Olu of uh, Wari Misen. I'm thinking that is also coming from all this uh, controversy. Um, can you tell us more about that? Is that true? Is the crown missing? Well, first of all, when you say the crown, there are several crowns. There are lots of crowns. Um, so the crowns my eyes have seen, tens, tens, probably come into about a lot. Let me not try to put a number on it. So when they say a crown is missing, okay, do you know exactly which one? Because they're labeled as well. So when you put out a story like that, you have to be careful because I may not have known that a particular crown was taken. So if I say, oh no, no crowns are missing, you know, somebody could come and say, actually, that particular one, maybe somebody wasn't paying attention and they broke the window and took it out of the glass case in which it was, you know, so, and obviously this is, um, this is a police matter as well. And, I, and a part of it is also in court. So that's just my response to that. And know. this would in no way affect? Oh, absolutely not. I think um, it's uh, in typical worry fashion. We are a very dramatic and animated people. And I think this has been a very dramatic and animated process. Um, I say this with all humility. I think it actually makes for a great Nollywood epic. Um, I think it should actually contribute to the anticipation of what happens on Saturday as opposed to making anyone feel, you know, what's going to happen. Then. Companies, I don't know if I'm correct, mm. and you also sit uh, or sat, I don't know which is now, as um, a director to several other companies. So how does this fit with uh, your new life mm. moving forward as the law firm? Very much intertwined. It's um, the way I see myself, to be very honest. What inspires me. I do not intend to compare myself to the modern monarchs in Nigeria. You know, be they our Bini neighbors or Ife or even the now former Emir of Kanu, who was a very pro-business monarch. In my own mind, I'm trying to create a new role. And I would be, even though we are not a sovereign nation per se, I would like to operate as though we're sovereign in that I represent the brand Ishekiri. So I should be able to walk into any room, a room full of traditional rulers, a room full of politicians, and even more importantly, a room full of businessmen and market Ishekiri to them. 
be it our resources, natural, human, our strategic location, our, even our culture, because obviously this being the BBC, you know, when you hear that, when there are all these arguments as to, oh, should they abolish the monarchy and the numbers come out that, look, this is how much the monarchy generates just by people walking to take pictures at Buckingham Palace and all that. That is a powerful source of income revenue that maybe Nigerians haven't properly yet um, identified and harnessed. So I'm not coming here to sit down, wear a crown and look pretty. I can do that, but I'm not going to settle for that. And I think when your leader is seen driving you know, your, your brand, I think it attracts the best quality of investment that um, you desire as a people. So you spoke about um, resources, talking about the, the, the question, the bit about you being a serial entrepreneur and right. coming from there to, right. yeah. You spoke about uh, businesses and resources. And um, this brings me back to um, a question I have, Your Majesty. It's that the Nigeria President, Muhammad Dubari, just signed into law the Petroleum Industry Bill, and a part of that provides that the NNPC should be unbonded. What do you think about that? I've been hearing about the unbundling of NNPC since uh, 2009. I, was, uh, I did my youth service in NAPIMS, which is a part of NNPC. So I was, those debates, I was in rooms where those debates were being had. For whatever reason, things don't necessarily pan out the way it ought to. And obviously, NNPC is a, is a major cash cow for the Nigerian government. Oil is a very hot button issue, and we in the Niger Delta, where oil is it's the epicenter, the communities that produce the oil, there is a lot of frustration. Not just simply because, oh, they are suffering and they don't have money, they are not seeing the gains of the oil, the oil activities, the environment is suffering. So in unbundling the NNPC, the local community will feel they must have a voice in that. Whether or not there's legitimate room for them to have a voice in that, you know. So that, that what I'm trying to describe is where the rubber meets the road, it may not be so smooth. And one hopes that full consideration is given to that process of where the rubber actually meets the road. And that law also uh, provides for 3% for the economy. They contribute a huge you know, percentage, a huge chunk of that. How do you see that? Do you think it's acceptable? Um, well, everyone will try their best with what they are given. Back to boarding school, we used to joke and say, you can tell an efficient manager of resources when you serve them rice and stew. No matter how plenty the rice is and the stew not so much, if they can make that stew straight, Both sides can say that's too small. Some can say, well, it's all you have, make do with it. I think we should begin by, even if we acknowledge 3%, it's not enough. That's when you demonstrate to the federal government or NNPC or whoever, look at what we have done with the 3%. I think you, it wouldn't be too difficult to encourage them to raise it up to 5%. Because I believe the federal government wants to see the Niger Delta prosper. So when someone is demonstrating, and once again, I, I, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, you know, so I'm thinking about the parable of the talents. The one that was given five talents, 10 talents, and the one with the one talent. So it's not necessarily whether you are given 1%, 5%, 10%, 1%.
what you are given, is there added value? Do you, so the person who has given it to you, when he comes around and wants to see, give account, and you're demonstrating, see what we've done, see what we've done, see what we've done. If our community is able to work together and have things to show with that 3%, and maybe one or two neighbor, neighboring communities, not so much. If we ask for that, yes, it may be unfair, but that we demonstrated efficiency, it makes it easier, or more palatable to the ears of the decision makers. They say, okay, they've done well. You can encourage them with some more. If we just go the typical way of demanding it's not good, it's not enough, look, okay, it's, you make the situation worse. So I'm not saying 3% is fine, let's settle for it. Let us demonstrate capacity and efficiency with it and then present a case for more. So I think that's, that's how I would respond to that. Your Majesty, you begin a new life as a king in a few in a date. Um, what is your primary goal or objective, if you like, for your people? What is that thing that you hope to achieve in your first 100 days of, in office, if you like, or the first few months you spend as the Olu of Wuri? Hmm. This sounds like a very political question. And if I had the direct control of the purse, I would have had brilliant answers to give you. Unfortunately, with the way things are, I do not have direct control of the purse over this, um, this kingdom. But from what I can do from here, I think is to encourage and lift the people up. Most would say that as a people, we have not been so low. In fact, that's actually very daunting for me. We, and we know that we are not as we were. So, picking the people's morale and encouraging them I do not necessarily have dollars in my hand to hand to every Shekiri person to say, oh, he put money in my hand. Because the way Nigeria is right now, including our people, that's what people want right now. Money in their pocket, food on their table, a roof over their head. And unfortunately, I don't have that readily to give in the first 100 days. So without making any promises in that direction, so that I'm not accused of being somebody who has come and as we say here, have fallen their hand, I promised and I failed. What I can and will do is speak and be seen to be different even in the way I, I address my people, in the way I interact with them, in the way I interact with our government, in the way I interact with our, um, the IOCs that operate here, in the way I interact with those would-be investors who want to come here, I would always be fair, I would always be warm and be welcoming, and hoping that in my own way I create a more conducive atmosphere that opens the door to opportunities that in turn will make life better for the people. And the one thing I have in my hand is the culture. And I hope to demonstrate that there is profitability in that. And um, with that, I'm sure more investment will follow that. And as I said, more opportunities are opened and um, the people are happy. Your Majesty Omo Shola Emiko, thank you for your time with us today. Thank you. And I wish you a fruitful reign. Thank you.